Our next speaker commissioned to the British Army's Parachute Regiment in 1998. Among his operational assignments, he has served in Northern Ireland, Sierra Leone, Iraq, and multiple tours in Afghanistan. He commanded the three para from 2015 to 2016, and he is now serving as the head of future force development for the British Army. It is my pleasure to introduce Brigadier Matthew Cansdell. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my microphone working okay? Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much for a kind introduction and uh, thank you for having me. General Don Harris, he's just jumped out, but I, I was keen to get his name right so I wasn't having to do press ups on stage uh, later on. Uh, and uh, so much gone. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, thank you to the MCOE uh, and to the US Army, actually. Uh, it's been great to be here a, and a real privilege uh, and an honor to be here, genuinely, and to be asked to speak. Slightly daunting, of course, but, but, but great nonetheless. And I think uh, one of the things being here as a Brit, and we recognize that uh, we don't have anything near the scale that the US Army have, uh, to be re-embedded in that idea of scale that you're talking about and the way that you conceptualize at the core and theatre level is fantastic for us. And to look at, therefore, what I want to talk about today, about how we, how we fit into this plan, how we fit into the plan with the US, how we fit into the plan with NATO. Uh, and I think what I'll try and do is give a bit of a blend perhaps over the subjects that we've covered over the last couple of days. So a little bit uh, on the character of conflict as we see it from, from a UK perspective. It's a UK perspective, a, a bit like uh, over here. There's, there's more than one available. Uh, people would have, of course, different and nuanced views, if, in fact, as we've had a, heard over the last couple of days. And I'll talk a little on modernization. Um, my job really covers... My, my main pit is looking at uh, 25 to 35, working out what the Army could and should be in that time frame, and then driving our innovation, research, and experimentation network to be able to provide the evidence that we need for that. Um, so as we look at the world, I mean, we, we've heard several times that it's an unpredictable place, and of course, we need to look no farther than the uh, amazing events of last weekend to see that's the case, uh, because uh, I'm sure you agree that no one expected the Cincinnati Bengals to reach the Super Bowl. Um, truly incredible. So an unpredictable world. Uh, General Donahue, Donahue sorry, gave a very clear uh, and compelling narrative to me about how we could compare what's going on in the world now to that, how it was standing at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, in terms of not only rapid technological change, uh, but also uh, a change in the world order, sort of pending as it comes through. Uh, and I think we can definitely see that here. I thought it was, a, it was a great analogy. I think also in the European theatre, we can definitely also see uh, uh, echoes of the Cold War coming through the situation that we face. Uh, it's not to say that everything's the same. And, and I think perhaps the strategic situation can look really similar uh, as, we, as we face it. But the operational context and the operational challenge that we, that we face, I think, is very different. And what we must need, what we must do is to make sure that our thinking is not lazy. I think there could be some back to the future uh, in our approach. Maybe there should be some back to the future in our approach as we hop back. And uh, we were talking earlier about Cold War positions and, and how we were forward deployed and what that meant. Maybe there should be some back to the future, but no excuse uh, for lazy thinking. So given this changing character of conflict, uh, the UK response has been to form, uh, well, has been sort of multi, multifaceted. One aspect has been we've changed our, our army headquarters. I now sit in a thing called the Futures Directorate. Um, it uh, shares a similarish title to Army Futures Command. I wouldn't wish to compare it exactly to Army Futures Command and the scale of Army Futures Command. But absolutely, I think created for a similar reason, to free us from uh, the urgency of the now in order to be able to take a better look uh, at the future and work out how we could and should change as we go forward. As I mentioned before, our main time horizon we're looking at is the 25 to 35 uh, time frame. Um, but that's because we're slightly constructed differently and we have other organizations, our Defense Concepts and Doctrine Center, think tanks, uh, and then our Defense Science and Technology Laboratory, which sit outside of the Army. Uh, and they are looking at be step beyond uh, as well, sort of to 2040 and beyond. And so our chief scientific advisor sits at defense level, looking at generation after next technologies in that sort of 2040 timeframe 
which fits much more closely to the aspirations of, of Army 2040. I suppose um, as we've looked at this, I would identify, and it's come out actually over the last couple of days, the twin challenges of being able to identify and evidence what the right change should be, that would probably one of them, and the second part of that challenge then, to be able to deliver that ch change uh, at the pace of relevance, to make it something that is, is valuable. So in terms of identifying and evidencing that change, um, I sort of hinted at this before, we need to be prepared to, to slay those sacred cows, not to just take things through because it's the way it always has been. A story perhaps to situate this, we have a thing, my French colleague here will know this very well, the Channel Tunnel uh, that we have uh, between, running between England and France. And when the Channel Tunnel was built, people said that they both needed and wanted a faster journey uh, to make this a viable thing. And so what we did is we spent $10 billion, pretty much, to building an underground extension through London that took 40 minutes, a further 40 minutes off the timeline to get uh, from London to Paris. A really logical answer to the problem that they were faced. When we stepped back, of course, we realized that for 0.1% of the price of this extension, we could have fitted free Wi-Fi to all the trains, which meant no one needed to get there any quicker. And for 10% of the price, we could have served free champagne for a decade and no one would have wanted to get there any quicker. Indeed, you might have wanted it to slow down. My point, of course, only being uh, that there is more than one way to solve a problem and just hitting everything with a hammer uh, doesn't make it a nail. Perhaps a more useful military or a, a much more closely sort of military story. General Carver observed uh, in reflection on the Second World War that the lessons, the hard lessons that the, uh, the, the British Army learned between 1939 and then Alamein uh, in the second half of 1942, that those lessons were actually really evident through the 1930s. It wasn't, it shouldn't have been a surprise. So the inventions that I mentioned that uh, General Donohoe spoke about before that really took place in that change of the century period, the beginning of powered flight, uh, the ability to have mobile communications, we didn't really introduce those until 1942, and those first three years were painful off the back of not realizing what was there. Indeed, in the 1930s, the British Army was still spending more money on horse fodder than it was on petrol. You can see how these changes are different for institutions like ours, difficult, sorry, for institutions like ours. We are conservative by nature, for very good reason. Our lessons are written in blood, but we must be able to look at these things and realize where we could uh, and should change. Part of this, I think, is a challenge uh, for us uh, to get better at measuring effect and output uh, rather than measuring inputs. We tend to measure what an army is doing by how many people it has sent somewhere. It's never been a great metric for an army, even since the Romans when they defeated much larger armies due to their tactics and equipment and training and all the rest of it. And now it's probably an increasingly, uh, as we've sort of heard over the last couple of days, uh, an increasingly poor metric. So we're really challenging ourselves to, to find measurements of effect and how we, how we grade ourselves by that and by that output. We're investing in, in wargaming, uh, and as we heard yesterday, experimenting and experimenting on operations. But by trying to put some work behind that to, to analyze what impact that has had on our adversary, because I think we often confuse activity uh, for effect. And this, I think, should help us to judge our future change and evidence that change. And evidence, of course, that thing we need both for our own assurity, uh, but also it's the thing that enables us to, to attract money uh, and resource. Uh, to try and hint at that and, and, and what, we're, what we're doing, we, are, we have increased our funding of uh, innovation research and experimentation at Army headquarters uh, fourfold in the last couple of years. Our CSA is spending $10 billion uh, over the next four years on, on next gen generation after next science and technology. Uh, and then at a micro level, we have just created in the British Army uh, an experimentation and trials group, uh, OF5 commanded, uh, with an experimentation battalion underneath them, really with the purpose of being able to envisage that force of the future in a microcosm, to be able to gather that evidence uh, so that we, as I say, we have that confidence and we can also demonstrate it to others notably ministers, to say, hey, look, with the right investment, this is what you could have across the force uh, as we take that forward. The second part, then, I said, if there's a twin challenge, is one is gathering that evidence and, uh, and identifying and gathering the evidence for it. 
Uh, and the second one is, is changing uh, at the pace of re relevance. And I look at uh, some of the work being done over here, and you, we've heard some of it uh, just there from General Camper or, and from the RCCTO and other areas where you've really put a massive amount of investment into, into changing at a fast pace. I have to say, uh, I hugely admire it. I sometimes muse on whether uh, your equipment program and your equipment portfolio that you hold drives your concepts or do your concepts really drive your, your, your program record and your equipment? And I think the answer to that probably is that the longer it takes you to go from concept to capability, the more the stuff, the equipment that you have at the moment will force your hand on, on concept. So in this fast changing world, I feel it's probably the most important thing to get after is being able to get that rapid change uh, going forward. If I talk a little bit about modernization, and I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but just to give a bit of an overview of our approach to modernization, I've spoken about in the headquarters, uh, not particularly interesting. Um, but if we, uh, our recent integrated review last year coming out of the back of that, uh, what we're positioning ourselves for is, is a more persistently engaged uh, force uh, with global hubs that allow us access uh, to certain parts of the world which we think are important to us. We've created uh, four Ranger uh, battalions within a, uh, within a BCT, uh, and this is another of those words, there are loads of them, uh, which needs translating as you, uh, as you fly across the Atlantic, because the Rangers that we're talking about are much more akin to, to US Tier 2 than they are to the, to the mighty 75th uh, Ranger Battalion based here uh, in Benning. So um, much more looking at uh, train advise a company, enable, uh, as, as we, uh, enable a company as, as they go forward rather than what the rangers are over here. But it's that sign of working with allies and partners and looking to be persistently engaged uh, as we do that. We've also uh, created an SFA BCT, uh, which is similar in nature to over here. We're creating EW battalions, uh, and previously we created our sixth division to really focus on information warfare, tactical cyber capabilities. So we have a champion for that within the force and that we put that information part alongside our ground maneuver to get that uh, combined maneuver effect that we're seeking. Uh, inevitably in the UK, um, the headlines go to the equipment programs. Uh, in our third division, our heavy division, uh, we're replacing all of the combat, major combat uh, equipments, uh, the Challenger 2 tank being converted to a Challenger 3 with a, with a serious upgrade, the introduction of the Boxer vehicle uh, and the Ajax vehicle as both a, a medium tank and recce vehicle. We've created a uh, a deep recce strike brigade equipped with uh, the Ajax platform again, which is a track platform, uh, and uh, we're modernizing the fires that they have, including uh, buying into PRISM that Major General Camper was talking about uh, just a few minutes ago. If those are the headline sort of equipment programs, of course, I think the key thing is, is not the kit itself, and this has come out again, but how these things operate. So what we're seeking to do is to look at how we generate that evidence and how we are confident in retiring, retiring with confidence the last vestiture of the army of the 20th century. And we introduce and usher in at pace uh, an army fit for the 21st information data age uh, combat that we find ourselves facing. We're clear that our raison d'etre remains combined arms maneuver and it remains high intensity. But I think that combined arms and what that means in terms of that character of conflict uh, requires review. We think that combined arms probably increasingly focusing on uh, defeating the find and strike cap capability of the adversary. That is not to say that the close fight won't exist or that it will just be a walk in the park at all. But a bit as we've heard, that ability to blind the adversary, prevent them being able to bring their, their capability to bear will be of increased importance. What we've witnessed from Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Nakora Karabakh is absolutely that armor and heavy armor has utility on the modern battlefield, but also that it has vulnerability if it is not wrapped into a proper combined arms concept as we've just been talking about. We are absolutely talking about hard, if you like traditional hard power in the form of, of armor vehicles, blending that uh, with the novel and with the increasing new technology. We see ourselves operating in a more dispersed tactical manner partly to create multiple dilemmas and overload on ISR and to get that security that we've been talking about over the last couple of days. And we're really experimenting um, with uh, and pushing the concept of operating in the urban 
as a right of choice as opposed to urban because it's something that we have to do, which traditionally has been certainly the view uh, in the British Army. I'll return um, a little bit to the, that urban idea uh, in a minute. So as we look at 25 to 35, we're trying to revise these assumptions on our overall purpose. And at the moment, uh, as you may well know, we're due to be part of the second battle, the reclamation battle uh, within Europe. And I think we've, we've heard that there are, when you get to that second battle, there are no good choices. No good choices at all. Now, people have given a, a very compelling argument for why um, we must optimize ourselves for that second battle because the first battle is so hard to win. Uh, and I think it, it's a really compelling case. But I also worry that that second battle becomes something that is uh, so incredible in its nature that it becomes something that you must do everything you can uh, to avoid. I was trying to think of this, of how I could sort of try and think this through. And, and I thought maybe, if you'll, if you'll stay with me for a moment, I thought maybe to try and see the picture in reverse is an interesting way to try and conceptualize the nature of the problem we face in terms of second battle. So come with me, if you will, on a little thought experiment. Uh, and please don't quote this to the politicians. So this thought experiment, let's imagine for a moment that the Baja Peninsula, that 1,200 kilometer piece of land that sticks down into the Gulf of California, the Calif Calif Gulf of California. Let's imagine for a second that instead of for the last 200 years, being the property of New Spain and then Mexico, but actually was at one point a state of the United States. However, not that long ago, it declared independence and became something that was relatively hostile. It turned to communism and was adopting a different, a different uh, model, political model to ourselves here in the United States. We've decided in the US here that we want that back. We want it to be the 51st state again. We've signaled this, we've given our intent. 50% of the population uh, in the Baja Peninsula consider themselves to be Americans anyway, and we think that this is a really good idea. Not only that, but right now we have about 100, 130,000 troops on the border ready to go into the Baja Peninsula. Our adversary, China in this example, doesn't want us to do that. It's politically more aligned to them. China with 29 smaller states aligned to it, some of whom aren't very supportive because actually they rely on gas and trade for the United States, is trying to get a coalition together to try and stop us doing this. And their method of doing that is they're going to say they're not going to contest us on the way in. What they're going to do is go through some prolonged political negotiation after we've achieved our annexation or re-establishment of Baha Peninsula as the 51st state. They will then launch from China right across the Atlantic and they're either going to conduct a landing onto the Baja Peninsula or they'll go to Guatemala and conduct a 3,000 kilometer land move uh, up to the peninsula, which by the way is roughly the same distance from French ports to Eastern Estonia, in order to do that. I don't think that we think that's a very credible option for the Chinese to launch. I don't think we'd be concerned about their capability to do that because the opportunity to strike them as they try and do that is, is, is so evident. I wonder at what point uh, one might consider striking into the ports in mainland China with hypersonic missiles, for example. One could see when one plays it in reverse that that idea of the second battle is something that will be very difficult to fight, much easier to defend, and that there'll be no winners as we go across. Um, if I flick back away from my sort of fairy tale, and, and I hope uh, that this sort of the idea of that uh, managed to catch imagination, because what we're trying to offer is, to, is, what we're trying to look at is to say, how can we best position ourselves in Europe uh, to, to win that first battle? Let's not accept that it's impossible to win. Let's do everything that we can uh, to do that. The question, I suppose, in the vernacular I ask myself is, how do we avoid Dunkirk so that we don't have to have D-Day? So what would this look like? And again, we're positing, we want to experiment, we want to work. Uh, with yourselves to play this through and, and, and work out what this looks like. But I think this probably looks like uh, an army that is focused on taking the advantage of the urban terrain, of the force ratios command, uh, required to retake that urban terrain, that works not just in those countries, but alongside the forces uh, of those 
countries that, that we want to protect. It's with those allies and host countries, I say. It's definitely combined arms. It is definitely prepared for and primed for high-intensity conflict. This is not a way of talking our way out of the problem. It is that mix of hard power, novel tech, and of winning that information and influence campaign as we go through. This, as I say, there's more work needed to, do the, to, to, to bring this to fruition, and we want to work with, uh, and we are working with Army Futures Command to try and sort of tease this out. But what we want to do is to make a virtue of our geography and our politics. The US is geographically difficult to, to, to project to, to do that from here in the European theater, uh, besides which, of course, uh, increasing uh, focus on Indo-PACOM. NATO is politically not well structured to react quickly and uh, there's another statement, uh, uh, to react quickly and to be our first mover. So we're trying to work out as a nation, how can we offer the most to the US? How can we offer the most to NATO uh, in terms of trying to win this first battle? In more general terms, I see the, uh, the confluence of, of, uh, uh, of move and counter move just playing through as you go through in this new character of conflict, of AI and counter AI, robotics, counter robotics, autonomy, counter autonomy, of sense versus counter sense. And we're going to continue fighting up that line, I'm sure, as we go ahead. And I still think we need the mass that we're talking about here that mass of the second echelon to deter and to act in all sorts of ways across the world. My comment there is not to try and take away from that mass, but really to, to add an aspect to it. So I'll conclude there and give time for questions. Uh, I might have provoked a, a couple of thoughts, I hope, anyway. Uh, hopefully I've given a, an idea of how we're sort of modernizing now and what we're going, uh, how we're going about that, as well as giving a little bit of thought on the character of conflict uh, and how we may, I say may, uh, approach that in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll ask the first question. What do you see as the greatest difference between the United Kingdom and the United States approach to modernization? We can spell honor with a U. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, different approach to modernization. Yes, sir. If there's like an assumption that we make or is there some way that we approach problems from your perspective that is very different from how the British are approaching this, this problem set. So I think, I think, and perhaps it's too obvious to, to be worthy of saying, but I think the, the first one, the obvious one is scale. Um, but one of the, and so that's almost a, a sort of a cheat answer. Uh, so I think, uh, let, me, let me answer it by saying what I really admire about uh, the US approach. Uh, I love the energy with which you approach things. I love the fact that um, you are, you are desperate for that capability advantage of the next step and that everyone pulls together to work towards it. Because I think uh, sometimes we, okay, sometimes we Europe perhaps uh, are slightly less convinced of the imminence of the threat and we don't act, we're not motivated in quite that same way. I've always admired that about the American military, American army, uh, and I remain so. And actually this two days has, has, uh, has just cemented that. Thanks, sir. Any questions from in the room? Sir, another question. Could you speak more? You had a definition of combined arms that I thought was interesting. Could you expand on, on the components as you see it of, of what, will, what will make up combined arms maneuver, combined arms warfare in the future? Yeah, so I, I didn't talk much about cross-domain, actually, and I probably should have done, because I think, um, because, because I, I think that cross-domain, and it's partly probably because we've had it so much the uh, last couple of days, I, I take it, took it as red. So I think, I think cross-domain is absolutely essential. I thought the points that General Campbell were making about at what, at what point do we see cross-domain capabilities brought down? I think combined arms in the future could potentially see sort of snow domes of capability because I, I really worry about the, the extent of the EW threat and the, the isolation that forces can, can expect to be under. So I think I can see sort of snow domes of capability where we're trying to push capability down to a much lower level so that they can act more independently. Um, and so I think a, a blend of, of combined arms, sort of the tr traditional combined arms, bringing in some of the things that uh, General Campbell was talking about in terms of counter US down to a much more lower tactical level. I think there is a challenge there, to, to digress slightly, about the extent to which one protects oneself against uh, a threat in, by point defense, which has traditionally been a sense, or the extent to which one deliberately goes out 
to, to target uh, adversary ISR capabilities, so to defeat them um, uh, forward and fast, rather than thinking I'm going to be more on a defensive footing. So I'm, I'm not sure I've completely answered the question, but it's probably where I'm going to go. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. So we have, a, we have a question back here, sir. Thanks. Uh, hey, w talking about uh, through the modernization in UK, how, how often or how well do you integrate simulations? You know, as we talk about scale uh, and the ability to replicate, you know, how, do you integrate simulations uh, in any manner? And if so, at what, you know, kind of at Sorry, what so level? I missed that last bit. Sorry. At what level? Integration of simulations? Yeah. How well do you do it if you do it? Uh, in training specifically, um, I could probably answer on training specifically. Is that I would even put on in uh, in concept, you know. Okay, the uh, okay so um, in war, in wargaming. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our wargaming center is is run by a defense and technology laboratory, defense science and technology laboratory (DSTL). Can I go to the acronym? Um, uh, and we we have invested increasingly in in, in wargaming. I think um, one of the issues, uh, one of the challenges we're trying to, uh, to, to recognize uh, has been about measurements of effectiveness. It tends to be better, uh, and we're better at mapping uh, tank on tank sort of hard power, you know, who's got the most capability. It's the wrapper, I think, that is harder to war game and that we're trying to, to do. And I don't just mean soft effects and influence, but, but as you ramp up, as you've been talking here about the core and the theater level, they've tended to operate in isolation and look at just sort of the LAN component. So we're increasingly trying to build in that sort of cross-domain, uh, cross-functional, uh, sorry, cross-domain um, examination into wargaming to, to put it in the right context. I, I'm not saying we're expert at it. We're trying to invest much more uh, further in it, sir. Matt, I had a question for you. I, I, I can't resist. The, uh, the analogy is too good on the first battle. So um, I'd actually like to ask you to go into a little bit more detail because our adversaries in particular think long and hard about winning that first battle. I'm um, going to talk tomorrow about China. Their entire way of war is predicated on that first fight. Russia thinks about it a little differently, but it's about a, a fait accompli with an immediate off-ramp, and that translates to a first battle. So in, in bringing it up, I would be really interested to hear you flesh out a little bit what we can do as a, as a joint team, the, the UK, the US, NATO, thinking about that, that European fight. What does that look like? And, and just flesh it out from, from what, how you think we could, we could manage that as a, as a joint team. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, I'll defend myself in the first instance by saying this is this is sort of early thoughts. We're projecting forward. You know, this is fair not, enough. We are we are a long way from doctrine here, um, and we're not even writing the concept. So, I'll, I'll, if if I go over a little bit of process, we're at the moment, uh, and we will publish by the end of May a document that lays out what we think the real challenge is that the British Army should be facing up to. We're trying to. Uh, we will then uh, this summer produce an exploratory concept that says, hey, we we think it's this, but as as a proper hypothesis. Um, by which I mean something that you try to disprove. And then we're going to spend a year uh, trying to evidence against that through wargaming, uh, through practical experimentation, trying to break it, trying to test it to destruction, to then write our concept in summer 23, to then develop doctrine from there. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to, to sort of answer all the way through. Um, but I think it's an expansion on... Uh, so if one accepts that the, that the force ratios required in urban areas are, are 10 to 1, or, or at least 10 to 1, we have recognized that our shortfall uh, potentially is in, is in mass, then what we want to try and do is to, is to flick that paradigm on its head and take advantage from that. That does require for first mover advantage. Uh, and I think that what perhaps we need to do in the British Army is work out, rather than trying to have a general theory of, of, of victory for what is a small army, albeit as part of a much better, a greater alliance, if we can make that more of a specific theory of victory, so that we geographically, temporally shape that to say what we're really for, rather than trying to spread the jam too thin, then I think we might be able to have greater effect. So we currently have a battle group, uh, Enhanced Force Presence in, in Estonia. So let's take that as an example forward only. I think one, one could see, and I sort of hinted at this, 
a much closer relationship between, say, UK and Estonia, it could be another NATO country and, uh, and, and another Eastern country, uh, another Eastern European country and a, and a Central European country, if you will, um, uh, where, where we recognise that actually we're much more, much more closely entwined within that with a more geographically focused, nationally focused alignment you can see then that you might be able to develop detailed plans for a city, a specific city, working with them part of the national defense plan uh, and built in, and that that could be a much more potent uh, military uh, deterrence because it genuinely has the ability to defeat. Um, as we've tried to sort of think through this and the fait accompli options, how does one give political choice while also remain, you know, while maintaining a sort of hard military shoulder? And there are certain things that I think would be difficult to escalate to on our side. For example, strikes into Mother Russia is a, is a, is a game changer at some point that would require some sort of political transference. So how do we play with the, with what ground are we prepared to give and what, what's really important to us and being much more um, specific and critical with ourselves about what really matters and what one's prepared to, to trade or have as, as areas of, of fighting. Does that get towards your question, Ian? So we have a question from one of our virtual participants uh, just asking about your, the British choices on uh, new equipment, new vehicles, combat vehicles, and the balance between mobility, survivability, and firepower. Are you making a conscious decision based on how you see the character war change, like wheels versus tracks, lighter versus heavier? Is, is there, what, what is your approach on the new vehicle platforms you're, you're working on, Challenger 3, Ajax, et cetera? So... Um, I sort of hinted at this before a little bit, I think. You know, at what, at what point does, do, the, do the vehicles you have in your equipment program shape your concept and what does your concept shape your, your equipment program? I think, I think we're doing a bit of both. Um, we, have, we have been shaped uh, away from certain capabilities that, that we had thought that we were having. It happens, happens to every nation. The politics uh, kicks in. Um, but we, I do think that what, what, we are, what we can look towards now that we've, with that mix is we have certain assets that are heavier, more powerful, uh, slower operational mobility. We have other assets that have greater operational mobility, the wheel platforms, obviously. And I think you know, to combine those appears to be an oxymoron. And I think this goes partly back to my point uh, about um, to what extent do we want to return to the future? Because there are ways to overcome... Uh, that go back to the future. There are ways to overcome some of those difficulties by considering how and where you position certain capabilities and certain uh, equipment types. And so uh, I think there are ways to make, to make a virtue uh, out of that. And it comes back again to my point about being specific about, the more specific you are about where you want to use the equipment, the more specific you can be about where you want to keep it and therefore negate some of the operational difficulties that come with everybody's very heavy equipment uh, and to be able to use those things more ably together. Thanks, sir. Follow-on question. The United States Marine Corps recently divested all tanks from their inventory. Is, are there choices that the United Kingdom is making in similar vein moving forward, the, leg legacy capabilities, if you will, that you're simply not going to carry forward into the future? Uh, I'm trying to think if we're deliberately divesting. Uh, so I don't think we're deliberately divesting out of capabilities. Uh, we are running the Challenger 3 program, and I try to say in my talk, uh, I think that the tank has an absolute place on the future battlefield. Uh, I think, um, uh, and that really stems from, because all the videos you watch, um, if you really want to kill a tank, you need a tank. If one person's got a tank, you need a tank, because there is still uh, a, a uniqueness to um, very fast kinetic energy rounds uh, that have got a unique and a really important part in the battlefield. Um, if anything, I can see aspects where you'd want to go have optimized urban equipment. Um, so, for example, you might want to, you might want to tank an urban cap in an urban scenario that doesn't have the same capabilities as your, as your free-range tank that you know, makes holes in big vehicles. It's more of a mobile pillbox, if you will, uh, and that is a, is, a, is, a, um, is, a, is a mothership for, uh, for, for uncrewed systems that would look very different, but it's still very heavy. So there are, there are no sort of equipment types that we're divesting out of because we think that they've sort of passed their day. There are things that we want to change and update. Someone mentioned electrification earlier. 
we're really pushing on the hybrid systems because of the power that it just enables you to have on the battlefield. Um, but no, not divesting out of, uh, Thanks, out of specific capabilities for that reason. Any further questions from the room? All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you.